Hello, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for coming to this talk from Dr. Salim al -Huk about how the financing for loss and damage agreement was reached in COP27. It's great to see so many familiar faces and welcome to any of you joining us from outside of the Teradotdo community. Um, my name is Greg Findlay. I'm a course director for Teradotdo's 12 week flagship course called Climate Change Learning for Action. This talk today is the keynote for the fellows in our newly launched YAKS cohort, and it is a, also a guest expert guest talk for the fellows in our ongoing Xeris cohort. These two cohorts together uh, represent more than 300 fellows from over 25 countries, and they come from a broad range of professional backgrounds. The Learning for Action course is an intensive exploration of climate science, climate impacts, and climate solutions, and it is a combination of written classes, live weekly lab sessions, deep dives, and expert guest talks and workshops. Teradotdo has an ambitious goal of getting 100 million people working on climate change this decade. To achieve this goal, we offer a combination of climate education, connections to employers and climate jobs, and a supportive community of people who want to make a difference on climate change. You can check out our programs at Teradotdo on the web, and you can find our app, which is available on the app, Apple App Store and Google Play. We offer a new cohort of this course, Learning for Action, starting about every six weeks. And our next course will start on February 8th. Well, and I like urge you to check it out if you're interested. Oh, I don't do anything. Uh, and I will ask everyone if you would please mute yourselves for a moment here. And um, before we get started, I just want to go over one little piece of housekeeping, which is although this talk is open to the general community. Only the fellows in our current cohorts will uh, have access to our question and answer platform on Slido. So fellows, if you haven't yet, you might want to check out the Slack post that shared the link to Slido. You can go there, you can post your questions, you can upvote other questions that you would like to hear the answers to. And now after all of that, I'm really honored and pleased to welcome Dr. Professor Salim al -Huk in the uh, he is the director of the International Senate for Climate Change and Development, ICCCAD, and he's a professor of the Independent University Bangladesh, IUB. He's also a senior associate of the International Institute on Environment and Development in the UK, and he's the chair of the expert advisory group for the Climate Vulnerable Forum. He's also a senior advisor on locally led adaptation with Global Center on Adaptation headquartered in the Netherlands. He's an expert in adaptation to climate change in the most vulnerable developing countries and has been a lead author of the third, fourth, and fifth IPCC assessment reports. And he also advises the least developed countries group in the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. He is a very busy man, as you can tell, and we're just honored to have him with us here. He's published hundreds of scientific as well as popular articles and was recognized as one of the top 20 global influencers on climate change policy in 2019. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Huck, and I will pass it over to you. Please take it away. Great. Thank you very much, Greg, and uh, hello to everybody. Thank you for inviting me. Very happy to be here. Let me start with... Um, two apologies. The first one being, I won't be showing any slides. I'll just be talking. And the second one being that um, I have a bit of a sore throat. So every now and again, I might start coughing <coughs> like that. <laughs> so uh, what I propose to do is to not talk for very long, uh, but to give you a sort of overview of where we stand on the topic of loss and damage globally and uh, in the UN Framework Convention in particular. And then I'm very happy to uh, take questions that make it more interactive, which I think will be more interesting uh, for everybody concerned, rather than listening to a long lecture. So let me start with um, the fact that uh, we just had the 27th uh, Conference of Parties of the United Nations Framework Convention <coughs> in Sharm el Sheikh in Egypt just a few um, weeks ago. And um, even though it was the 27th uh, Conference of Parties, and incidentally, I'm one of the few people around who has actually been to all 27. I have attended every single one of the 27 conferences of parties, but I 
hasten to add that I don't go as a negotiator. I go as an observer. I'm a scientist. I'm a researcher. I'm a professor. <clears throat> but I do have a function in the negotiations as an advisor to the least developed countries, which is one of the uh, formal caucus groups of most vulnerable countries. <clears throat> there are four of them, four such subgroups. The least developed countries, LDCs, who are 46 of the poorest, most vulnerable countries, mostly in sub-Saharan Africa, but also in Asia, including my country, Bangladesh. Uh, second group called these Alliance of Small Island States, 40 plus countries, islands in the Pacific, like Tuvalu, <coughs> Kiribati, and in the Maldives, in the Indian Ocean, and then in the Caribbean. A third group is the entire continent of Africa. They negotiate as a block, as a group of 50 countries. And then the fourth <coughs> and final subgroup are a group of Latin American countries in South and, uh, South and Central America called ILAC, A-I-L-A-C. And these four vulnerable country groups together, uh, they come to 101 countries, if you take overlaps into account, because <clears throat> as I said, many of the African countries are also LDCs, at least developed countries. So if you take those overlaps into account, we have 101 countries. <clears throat> and that's a significant number because the entire UNFCC is, consists of 195 countries. So a 101 out of 195 is more than 50%. Even more significantly, in the bigger group of all developing countries, it's called the G77 in China, or group of 77 in China. It's actually 135 countries uh, representing the develop, developing world and uh, represents about 5 billion people living on the planet. That bigger group, uh, it's these four subgroups are part of that bigger group. And within that G77 in China, these four uh, subgroups represent more than two thirds majority. So um, taken together, the, each of these countries are quite small and insignificant and poor countries, but taken together in terms of numbers, we are a significant number. <clears throat> and so whenever we are able to put together a common position, first within the G77 and China group, where we have countries like China and India and Brazil and so on, big developing countries, um, we have to convince them first to adopt our positions or accept our positions or support our positions. And then uh, once they do that, we can then take it into the bigger arena and uh, negotiate with the developed countries. So that is how the issue of loss and damage over the years has emerged. It's a topic that started off, it's actually a very old topic, it started at the <laughs> beginning of the negotiations for the UN Framework Convention, raised by the small island states who even 30 years ago realized that if climate change continues at the pace it was going, then eventually many of their countries would simply go underwater. They would disappear off the face of the earth. It was an existential threat to them over a period of time, over many decades. And they raised this issue of loss and damage from the beginning, but they never got any support. Uh, they kept on receiving it, but they never got support. And it was only in the last few years uh, when all four subgroups, vulnerable country subgroups, got together with the small island states. And we started raising this issue collectively. As I said, we used the collective weight of our numbers, even though individually we were small countries, but we were a majority, a super majority within the G77 in China and a majority in the bigger UNFCC. And we were able to uh, successfully make a number of uh, 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 agreements 
The first one being uh, the setting up of the Warsaw International Mechanism on Loss and Damage in COP19 in Warsaw. And then a few years later in COP21 in Paris, we had a successfully um, have everybody agree to include a separate uh, article on loss and damage, Article 8 of the Paris Agreement. But neither of these two uh, achievements, both of these two achievements were confined to um, gathering data, having dialogues, sharing information, doing research. None of them were uh, had any finance attached for helping the victims of human induced damage. <laughs> so even though we had been asking for finance, we never got the finance part of our demand accepted. And um, even in COP25, we raised the demand for finance and the demand for uh, a technical body. We got the technical body. <laughs> it's called the Santiago Network on Loss and Damage. But we didn't get the finance body. So in Glasgow last year, in COP26, we were able to get together um, all the developing countries jointly to demand and ask for uh, something we called the Glasgow facility for finance for loss and damage. Finance facility for loss and damage. <clears throat> this text was in the draft Glasgow Climate Act text until the last day of the COP. But then, as almost always happens nowadays, the COP was extended by an extra day. And by the time we came back, uh, the day after it was supposed to have ended, we were given a text where the text had changed from the Glasgow Finance Facility to the Glasgow Dialogue on Finance for Loss and Damage. And that dialogue would last for three years. And this was presented to us as a take it or leave it. And the US <coughs> in particular claimed this was a big concession from their side. They agreed to talk about it for three years, but they weren't going to do anything, just talk. And needless to say, we felt it was a great disappointment, but we had to accept it. So we went back to the drawing board and before COP27, which was going to be held at that time in Egypt, uh, we uh, put on the agenda for COP27, a new agenda item under finance, not a separate one on loss and damage, but under finance for uh, looking at finance for loss and damage. And the incoming Egyptian presidency, together with the, <coughs> excuse me, the UNFCC secretariat, uh, accepted it as a provisional agenda item. But as with everything in the COPS, uh, decision making is by consensus, which means that every word, every comma, every period has to be agreed by nearly 200 countries. Even if one or two countries disagree, then you don't have consensus and it doesn't go through. And so we knew that going into the COP, even before the COP started, we would have to fight for adopting it as an agenda item. We knew that certain countries were not going to allow it to be accepted as an agenda item. And that's exactly what happened. So even before the COP started in Sharm El Sheikh, the night before the opening, uh, we had an all night negotiations, particularly with the United States, who finally were persuaded uh, by other developed countries uh, who had agreed with us uh, to drop their objection. But they did it with a caveat. And the caveat was they inserted a clause, which they had inserted previously in the Paris Agreement as well, which is that uh, it could not be used for liability and compensation. So the US is particularly sensitive to the notion of liability and compensation. And in fact, we accepted that. So we didn't, we weren't using the notion of liability and compensation. We were just using the notion of responsibility. All countries who are emitting greenhouse gases are responsible for global warming that it causes, and hence are also responsible for any losses and damages that it causes. And we need to accept that. That's basically what we have agreed. So we managed to get it on the agenda. 
then we had two weeks of very intensive negotiations, uh, which resulted in a major breakthrough uh, for the first time in, in 30 years of agreeing to set up a loss and damage finance mechanism. Now, <clears throat> all it is is a, a set of words saying we agreed to do something. There's no money. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen. We still have to do that. What we've agreed is to set up something called a transitional committee with representation from different parts of the world that will be set up, in fact, by tomorrow is the deadline. And then the transitional committee will be tasked with coming up with ways forward on where do we get money from, how much money can we get, how much money we need, who would manage the money, and then who would be eligible to receive the money. All very legitimate questions, which we don't have answers for, but we will come up with ways forward, and we will then um, come up with ideas and negotiate an outcome, hopefully in COP28, which will be a year from now <coughs> in Dubai. <coughs> so that's where we stand on the, uh, the negotiations on loss and damage. But before I end, let me mention <coughs> something else, which is, I feel, even more important and perhaps relevant for uh, those of you who are uh, joining this course or have been part of this course. And that is one of the reasons why we finally succeeded in COP27 after 30 years of trying. In my view, I get asked this question a lot. I would say there are two big factors. One, uh, the most important factor is the reality on the ground. Climate change is now happening. The the sixth assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which came out uh, a few months ago, <coughs> has quite unequivocally, scientifically, given an attribution to the impacts of human-induced climate change. It's happening now, all over the world. And it's not just happening in the poor countries, it's happening even in the rich countries. The floods in Germany, the hurricanes in the US, wildfires in California, <coughs> heat waves in Europe, etc. All of these are now attributable to the fact that global temperature has gone up well over one degree due to human-induced climate change, greenhouse gas emissions. So there's no scientific question anymore. This is now absolutely correct, scientifically valid, attributable. This attribute, the attribution science has now developed to a level where the scientists can make very credible attributions of how much additional damage is caused by hurricanes or floods because temperature has already increased, okay? <coughs> Climate change doesn't cause these impacts, but it makes them worse. And we can calculate how much worse they are. And a very significant uh, actual event took place between COP26 and COP27 in Pakistan, as you know, they had devastating floods. And as it happened, Pakistan currently chairs the group of 77 in China. And they were the chair in Glasgow, where they put forward this demand on behalf of the whole group. But they did it as, a, as their role as chair of the group on behalf of the group. Then they got hit by a devastating flood. And the floods, damage was estimated to have been 50% higher because of global temperature rise. It was not a natural event anymore. It was a nature plus human caused event. And the devastation killed hundreds of people, caused a huge amount of damage. The estimated damage was about $30 billion. And the government and people of Pakistan got absolutely hammered. And they got the, uh, the issue. And they took this issue much, much more seriously. So the prime minister of Pakistan came to Sharm al-Sheikh at the opening, made a huge speech about this. The secretary general of the UN incidentally went to Pakistan, <clears throat> saw the devastation, and he was completely convinced that this was loss and damage and that the polluters now had to pay. <laughs> He became a great champion as well. And the, uh, the Pakistani Minister for 
climate change, uh, Shari Rahman, she was a very, very vocal, and very effective leader of the G77 in China in, in Sharm el-Sheikh. So <coughs> in Sharm el-Sheikh, the developing countries under the leadership of Pakistan took a very, very strong position, a very united position, and they were able to convince all the other countries, particularly the US, to not object to the establishment of the, <coughs> the new <coughs> funding facility for loss and damage. And that really contributed within the negotiation space, which is always a very unlevel playing field where big countries have a much bigger say than smaller countries, but smaller countries occasionally are able to convince big countries to do something they didn't want to do if we can get everybody together to face them down. And we were able to do that. So even though it might sound, might not sound like it is a big deal. We have now created a new uh, fund for dealing with loss and damage. And so the final point I'll make, and then I'll, I'll be very happy to take questions and have a discussion, okay. is that COP27, even though it's the 27th conference of parties over the course of last 30 years of dealing with <coughs> climate change at the global level is actually a very, very different COP from every previous one. And I characterize it as COP1 of the new era of losses and damages from climate change happening every day somewhere in the world. Every day, if you watch your television screen, you will see a climate event happening somewhere in the world, developed country, developing country, <coughs> which is considerably worse because of the temperature rise that we have already done with the emissions of greenhouse gases. So we have locked ourselves in, in the near term at least, that's this decade, to every day being worse than the day before. And we haven't seen the, the worst yet. It's just coming. It's going to come. And none of us are ready for it. None of us are prepared for it. Rich country, poor country, none of us are ready for it. So this is a game-changing game phenomena, a game-changing um, situation, which still hasn't sunk in. Uh, you know, for people who've been following climate change, they think, okay, COP27 went, and then there'll be COP28, and then <coughs> business as usual. Isn't usually not going to work. It's not ready. It's not prepared. So all of us, and I now speak to everybody here, all of us, every single one of us, need to put on our activist hat on and think of ourselves as citizens of planet Earth first and citizens of our own country or our own town or our own village a, a very far second. As citizens of planet Earth, we are faced with a global problem of a scale we have never faced before. That is a planetary scale problem that is a potentially civilization threatening impacts that are yet to come that we are simply not ready for. And all of us Globally, we need to be doing what we can where we are, wherever we happen to be located, whatever our profession happens to be. But we need to be linking up with fellow citizens, fellow professionals around the world, as you are doing here, and working together in a spirit of solidarity to help us tackle this global problem, which every single citizen on the planet needs to be involved in and i very much support your aim of getting 100 million people uh, uh, involved and activated that's exactly what we need to do and we need to have that balance of people equitably distributed <coughs> geographically across the global north and the global south and in particular my work uh, which i haven't really talked about but my my day job is working with the most vulnerable uh, developing countries and communities in my country, Bangladesh, but also in other least developed countries where I run a network of universities 
called the LDC Universities Consortium on Climate Change, LUCCC, <coughs> or LUC for short, where we do knowledge sharing, capacity building to prepare ourselves for the impacts of climate change because we are at the front line of those impacts and we will be at the front line of losses and damages as well. So that's a new area that we are investing our time and effort in, in enhancing uh, knowledge through research and sharing that knowledge uh, for capacity building at the country level as well as at the global level. So perhaps I'll stop there and, and I'd be very happy to take questions. Yes, thank you very much for uh, sharing that information with us and for all of your work over those 27 years of COPs uh, to represent the, the less developed countries. Um, we do have a number of questions that are coming in and uh, some of them, I'll, I'll start with a couple of questions that go back to uh, really, what is kind of the point of all of this? And, and what I mean by that is the, the idea is that these less developed countries are suffering the worst impacts, but did less to cause these impacts and therefore should be compensated in some way. So maybe you could expand on that. And also, we have some questions from Tim and others. What is the difference between liability and responsibility? or uh, distinction between losses and damages and liabilities and compensation? And could you share a little sure. about that? Sure, so let me um, give a, a framing for how to explain these um, wordings and differences between them. The framing is that um, the climate change problem is a manifest problem of global climate injustice in that the problem is caused by emissions of rich people all over the world, even including rich people in Bangladesh, but rich people mostly living in rich countries. So rich countries have a much bigger carbon emission profile that are causing impacts around the world, but those impacts are primarily hitting and first hitting the poorest people on the planet. Even in rich countries, it's poor people who are being hit. And so <clears throat> whatever religion you happen to be, Christian, Hindu, Muslim, Buddhist, or even if you don't have a religion, you will accept that that's not right. That's morally wrong. That should not happen. That should not allow to be happened. We should protest it. We should object to it. We should find ways to stop it from happening. And that's the framing under which we are arguing for loss and damage and compensation and liability. However, in the UNFCC, as I mentioned, the, the UNFCC is not a court of law. It's a treaty for all the countries in the world to come together and agree to do things. And everything has to be agreed by everybody, as I said. It's, it's a consensus, not majority rule, majority countries telling others what to do. <laughs> so everybody agreeing and everybody having a, an uh, ability to object. And so when we have the polluters sitting across the table with the victims of pollution, the victims can demand compensation. But if the polluters don't agree, then we can't get an agreement. And that's the story of the last 30 years, by the way. They, we've demanded and they said no, and that's it. And so what we agreed to do is we are not demanding that anymore. We are not saying liability and compensation. In fact, <coughs> interestingly, the origin of the term loss and damage is in itself a euphemism for liability and compensation because the terms liability and compensation were not allowed. These are taboo terms. You know, they, we are not allowed to invoke liability and compensation in the UNFCC. So we call it loss and damage. They agreed to call it loss and damage instead. Right? And we agreed to that. Now, what does that mean? It means that, as I said earlier, we are moving forward on the basis of accepting a sense of responsibility 
all countries must accept responsibility for the pollution that they are causing, all countries. And we had this argument actually last year in Glasgow, in COP26, where, as I said, we failed to get an agreement inside the UNFCC. But very interestingly, even though we were, the UN Framework Convention COP was being held in the conference center in Glasgow, inside the conference center, we failed. But outside the conference center, we were in the city of Glasgow. The city of Glasgow is in the country of Scotland. The country of Scotland has its own parliament, has its own budget, has its own first minister. And as it happens, it actually has its own climate finance budget. And the government of Scotland, before COP26 started, decided to double its climate finance budget. And it began, <clears throat> the first minister, Nicola Sturgeon, agreed to allocate one million pounds for a brand new loss and damage fund, which she accepted was different from adaptation and mitigation. It was because she said this in her speech that Scotland had benefited from the industrial revolution, became a rich country due to the industrial revolution, but also caused damage because of its emissions. She accepted that responsibility and she put a million pounds on the, on the table to deal with it. Not a huge amount of money, but symbolically much more than every other leader who came to Glasgow. Uh, the President Biden came, gave zero dollars. Angela Merkel came, gave zero euros. Boris Johnson came, gave zero pounds. Nicola Sturgeon gave a million. And then at the end of the COP, she actually challenged other leaders to match her. The only other political leader that matched her was the head of the province of Wallonia in Belgium, who put a million <coughs> euros on the table. And at the end of the COP, she doubled the amount from 1 million to 2 million. So in Glasgow, we had the beginning <coughs> of a few leaders moving forward to accept responsibility and to put some money on the table to address the, the problem of loss and damage. And then between Glasgow and Sharm el Sheikh, a number of other countries broke ranks. Denmark said they'd give 100 million kroner, which is about $10 million. Germany started something called the Global Shield under the G7, and a few other countries as well. So <coughs> countries started breaking ranks and saying, yes, they, they accepted responsibility and they're willing to put some money on a voluntary basis into this fund. Now, in, in uh, Sharm el Sheikh, we got more pledges to do that. Um, Nicola Sturgeon came to Sharm el Sheikh and she added another 5 million pounds from Scotland <coughs> to support actions on loss and damage. But so the, the ball has started to roll, but all of these uh, funding uh, pledges were happening outside the UNFCC. They were <coughs> by individual countries or groups of countries who were deciding to put some money into a pot and then decide what to do with that money themselves. What we were asking for in the UNFCC in the COP was a collective responsibility within the UNFCC, all countries coming together to agree that we should do something. And that's what we achieved in uh, <coughs> Sharm el Sheikh at the end. We've got an agreement. Now we have to build on that agreement. The agreement doesn't mean anything until it actually delivers something. We know that. But we are going, we are hopeful that we will now be able to deliver. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thank you very much for that. To follow up on that and really going with where uh, you ended the, the answer, what do you imagine will be the ultimate outcome from loss and damage negotiations, say, in 10 years' time? And that question's from Jonathan. Well, I'll tell you what I hope, <laughs> whether my hopes come to fruition or not, <laughs> will remain to be seen. I hope that we have crossed a very important Rubicon in COP27. Namely, we have moved, in my view, from an adversarial position where we, the developing countries, vulnerable countries, were asking for conversation to a 
common position. All countries have now agreed that we shall do something. So now we are all together. And the task we have is to come up with good ways to deal with the problem. We've all agreed we want to deal with the problem. <coughs> now we have to come up with good ways to deal with the problem. And there are three things in my view that would help us to achieve that. The first is agreeing where we would get the money from. And here we now need to step up the uh, advocacy for making the actual polluting companies pay for the pollution that they are causing. Okay, now let me expand on that. There are just around 60 fossil fuel companies around the world, not many, just a few dozen, who are currently making trillions of dollars of profits, pure profits, not just expenses, profits, exorbitant amounts of profits, which are being expanded because of the Ukraine-Russia war, huge amounts of profits. Now, if we were to agree that every country that has a fossil fuel company registered in their country imposes a 10% tax, global tax on the profits, just the profits, let them keep 90% of their profits, but let's take 10% of their profits and put it into a new loss and damage fund to pay the victims of their pollution, right? They're making money by polluting. They are harming people. Let the polluters put money in the pot. Easily done, <coughs> if we all agree. That would immediately, by COP28, in fact, if we agree to it there, raise in the order of $100 billion overnight. And this money is not coming from the taxpayer, the so-called taxpayer that we keep telling, being told has, you know, doesn't have money left to give. Uh, it's coming from the profits of companies who are polluters. And in fact, many countries are already looking at taxing these exorbitant profits that the companies are making already anyway. This is obscene, the profits that the polluters are being able to make. And so that's one source that we can certainly tap if we put our heads together and agree to do it. Secondly, we need to think about who should be eligible to receive funding. And again, here I have a uh, particular <coughs> view and that is that the poorest and most vulnerable people on the planet who generally live in the poorest and most vulnerable countries, but they are also poor and vulnerable people even in developing big developing countries or even in developed countries, the poorest and most vulnerable people on the planet should be the primary recipients of this. And we should find a mechanism to get the money to them quickly and immediately without having them come to us with a begging bowl with projects. It's not project, immediate aid to help the victims. When there's a flood in Pakistan, we fly to Pakistan and say, here's some money to help the people. <coughs> and we, we are proactive in supporting uh, the most vulnerable people on the planet. That's the two ends. Where do we get money from? Who do we give it to? <coughs> and then the third element is in between. How do we manage this? Uh, do we use existing mechanisms? We have quite a few of them that we could tap into and use. Not everyone is uh, fit for purpose, but they could be repurposed. Or do we create a brand new fund, which a lot of people have uh, allergies to, but I think there can be a case for a brand new fund that does things that nobody else does. And I'll, I'll, set, I'll end with one example of what would qualify for that. Um, in my country, in Bangladesh, every single day, in Dhaka city, the capital, in the order of three plus thousand people <coughs> arrive by bus, by boat, by train, by rickshaw, and they disappear into the slums of Dhaka. We have nearly 300 slums in Dhaka. These people are climate refugees who have been forced to flee 
their homes, mostly in the low-lying coastal zone of the country. Over time, <laughs> they are going to add up to many millions. Nobody is looking out for them. Nobody knows who they are. The government doesn't know. The Red Cross doesn't know. Aid agencies don't know who they are. Nobody is keeping track of them. Nobody is helping them. They are falling through the cracks. And they are genuine climate refugees or climate migrants or climate um, displaced people. There's no system working for them. There are systems for other things. Whenever there's a flood or a, a, a major event, there are there's the UN OCHA, the uh, humanitarian systems. There are international NGOs that come in, usually with too little too late, but they nevertheless, they do mobilize and provide support. But for climate migration, there's no system on earth at the moment. It's falling through the cracks and it's a climate change problem. It's being caused by sea level rise and salinity in the low-lying coastal zones of all over the world. And so <clears throat> we may need to create something for things that don't have anything existing to deal with them. But we'll have to work on these, all of these. Uh, thank you for that information and, and uh, for letting us know about these issues. Um, we have some questions about who do you believe will pay in the end? Who will pay the most for loss and damage? Will it be polluting industry uh, corporations? Will it be governments and thus taxpayers? And I'll add to that, how big an impact was it or has it been that there's been such a large delegation of fossil fuel companies at the COP27? I believe it was the largest delegation, larger than any individual nation. So uh, yeah, how big an impact will that Great have? question. So let me answer the first question first. Uh, who will pay the most? That's a no brainer. The victims will pay the most. The victims are paying the loss and damage right now, all right? The question is, what can the polluters do? And that's all of us in, individually. What can we do to help those victims? They are paying and they will continue to pay. And they will be the biggest payers of the uh, losses and damages that are going to happen, that are happening and are going to happen. There's no question about that. We know who they are. The question is, what are the rest of us going to do? And uh, that is the challenge to the rest of us to come up with ways to take responsibility and do something for those victims. They are our victims, by the way. You and I have a carbon footprint. Every single one of us, I would challenge on this call, have a carbon footprint, which is way over global average. And therefore, each of us, on a scale of polluter to non-polluter, we are all polluters. And even if we try to reduce our pollution by, you know, becoming vegetarians, not flying, uh, you know, turning our lights off, all good things to do, we still won't be able to reduce our footprint enough to avoid uh, being polluters. And therefore, the first point that we have to do individually is to accept moral responsibility. I am a polluter. I take responsibility. I want to do something for the victims of my pollution. It's, my pollution is not a victimless pollution. There are victims. I want to take some responsibility. That's the first act. Then I have to figure out what can I do? What are the possibilities for me to actually do something on behalf of those victims of the impacts of climate change? And the first thing that we ask, I ask, is a sense of solidarity. Get to know them, find out who they are. I have lots of victims in my country in Bangladesh. If you want to know who they are, get in touch with me. I'll put you in touch with them, talk to them. We, you don't need money. We're not asking for your money. We're asking for your solidarity, your sympathy, your empathy, your hum, human uh, contact, and trying to figure out together what we can do to solve this global problem. And that is what I'm asking every single individual when I say you have to act as a planetary citizen, is take responsibility for your impacts on the planet. And as I said, I'm pretty sure every single one of us, unless you can prove me wrong, is a polluter on, on a global average scale. Yeah, thank you. Um, really important. Um, 
So various questions here, and, and just to add to the what you just responded to, but there's a question about, you mentioned putting on our active activist hats, each, each one of us. Besides our empathy and our concern and our uh, acknowledging these victims, what can we do best to support efforts to give teeth and resources to the loss and damage fund? Well, uh, that's a very important um, function as citizens. So I, as I said, first of all, individual responsibility, uh, do what you can, reduce your emissions if you can, your own carbon footprint, whatever you can, reach out to the victims, and then act in solidarity with your, your friends, your cohorts, your colleagues, your family, to change the attitude of the leaders of your own country. We are being let down by our leaders collectively, all leaders. And they have let us down very badly over the last 30 years. They have promised to do things, but they haven't done them. So in each of your situations, in each of your countries, <coughs> you need to mobilize at the national level to the, uh, to the level of you know, democratic space that you have in your own country, some country, other countries to activate the population to change your leaders or to get the change the leaders to change their minds. And this is quite possible. Um, I'll give you two examples. The fact that President Biden uh, became president and defeated Trump can largely be attributed to the young people in the United States voting for whom climate change was a big issue. And they have actually um, uh, continued to influence Biden's attitude to climate change. Biden doesn't believe in climate change. You know, he is as Trumpian as Trump was. He didn't uh, personally have any uh, knowledge or uh, sympathy for the cause, but they made him. So whatever the U.S. under Biden is doing is in, in, in response to pressure from young people in the Democratic Party uh, to uh, Biden. Similarly, the fact that Lula defeated Bolsonaro in Brazil massive climate change influence of electors uh, who elected him. And had they not done so, you know, that Bolsonaro coming back <coughs> would have been a, a setback of epic proportions for us. The Amazon would be completely screwed up. And so we can make a difference politically if we um, activate our capabilities as citizens under democratic norms, if we have those norms available to us to elect new leaders in. Thank you. And you've talked about this a little bit, but we have a question that's gotten a number of votes. That is, what countries have been most and least accommodating uh, in the COP27 negotiations? And how does Russia's absence influence discussions regarding global CO2 emissions? If you wouldn't mind going a little further on that. <laughs> sure. So. Just to pick up on your previous um, second question about the, the lobbyists from the oil companies, the, the lobbyists from the oil companies uh, and fossil fuel companies more broadly are amongst the most effective uh, you know, and powerful lobbyists around the world. And they are so powerful that they actually control a number of governments. Uh, they certainly control the United States, the most powerful government in the world under President Trump. Trump didn't know anything about this. He was just mouthing words they put in his mouth. And he was, you know, paid for by the coal, coal industry in, in the United States when he even ran for president. They, they are the ones who bankrolled him. And they are the ones who imposed their views on him to withdraw from the Paris Agreement. And so the fossil fuel companies in many countries, Saudi Arabia is another example. Saudi Arabia is a petrostate. It, it's controlled by Saudi Aramco, the petroleum company. And there are others as well. So the petrostates and the petrol uh, fossil fuel lobbyists are now, uh, they used to be behind the scenes and let the governments argue for them. <coughs> they have now come out fighting they are fighting for their right to pollute and we are going to have to fight them there's no way we can accommodate them they cannot be allowed to continue to profit from pollution 
And so we are going to have to get together to deal with them. And the few countries that they control, Russia being one of them. Russia is also a petrol state. And so these uh, companies and the governments that they control have to be fought. They have to be opposed. They really are not negotiating in good faith. They are negotiating in bad faith. They come to the meeting to destroy any uh, movement. They, they hamper movement. And so we have to be able to deal with them. It's not going to be easy. Thanks. Um, we have a question from Cassie here that says, can you offer an example of what loss and damage compensation uh, would mean both in dollars and actual implementation for an individual country? And uh, I will just switch the, her question to say, like in Bangladesh, what would that look like? Sure. And what would you hope for? So that's a great question. So let me say in Bangladesh, you know, we are not sitting idle. We are not waiting for the COP, the UNFCC, and the global community to come to our rescue. We are actively, we have been for the last decade, very active on adaptation to climate change. We are one of the world's leaders on adaptation. And we are now taking on loss and damage as well. We are in the process of developing our own national mechanism on loss and damage to figure out what the impacts are likely to be who's going to be impacted, <coughs> how those can be uh, helped and affected, in addition to what we normally do. So, you know, we get hit in floods all the time. We have a fairly robust uh, cyclone warning, flood warning system, actually one of the best in the world that minimizes the loss of life in particular. It doesn't minimize so much damage, but it does loss of life. And <coughs> we also try and help the the victims once these events happen. Everybody in Bangladesh, we step in and we help everybody else. We, it's a huge sense of resilience and solidarity amongst the population. And we are now looking at how we can improve on the systems that we do have and make them more fit for purpose to the future, which is going to make these events even worse. And to develop our own national <coughs> mechanism with our own funds. By the way, we have our own climate adaptation fund of our own. For the last 10 years, the government of Bangladesh has been putting $100 million of its own budget into national adaptation plans. And we've been funding hundreds of projects by government and non-governmental uh, organizations. And we've been going up a very steep learning curve on how to adapt to the impacts of climate change. We're not sitting idle. We're not waiting for the, the rest of the world to come to its senses and come to help us. First responsibility is help ourselves. And we are doing that. And what we are doing also at the same time, as I said, through the <coughs> network of universities, is we are building that capacity at the national level in all the least developed countries, the most vulnerable countries, at the national level, helping them to figure out what they need to do, even if no help comes from abroad, because they owe it to their own citizens to be better prepared. And nobody is well prepared. In fact, even the developed countries are not well prepared. They can learn a lot from Bangladesh. Yeah, thank you. Um, got a, a number more of questions more, but I want to be respectful of your time. So we'll just see where we get here. But uh, there's a there's a question here that, you know, it's taken a long time. I, I think I'm going to put a few questions together, actually. There's, it's mm -hmm. taken a long time to get anywhere. Um, you know, what are your thoughts on persistence and, hope in the future? and then what could a country like the United States or these petro states you've talked about, could they back out of this agreement or how might they be able to slow down progress on setting up this fund or mechanisms for the fund? Well, we have made, um, failed to make good progress, that's for sure. Um, but we haven't made zero progress. We've made some progress, but it's not enough. The problem is getting worse and we are not being able to prevent it getting worse. So that represents a failure. On the other hand, you know, for a planetary problem and 200 countries on planet Earth, we don't have a planetary government. There's no, you know, president of, of the Earth. 
there's just 200 countries who come together and we have to agree things by consensus. So the good news is we have done that. We have a treaty. We've agreed what to do. We have the Paris Agreement where we've agreed what to do. But we're not doing what we agreed to do. So now we have to actually implement what we've agreed to do. And one of the ways that I describe the Paris Agreement in particular is that we needed the, <coughs> the governments, the 200 governments, to come together to achieve the Paris Agreement, which was to keep global temperature below 1.5 degrees and for the rich countries to provide $100 billion a year to the developing world for mitigation and adaptation, <laughs> not for loss and damage, that came later. Um, but we are failing to implement it. Every COP since then is just taking tracking our progress and the progress is not being good. And so we have to up our game in terms of raising ambition. <clears throat> but the beauty of the Paris Agreement is that while it required all the governments to come together to achieve that agreement, it doesn't need the governments alone and it doesn't need all of them to act on the agreement. Every single one of us can actually act on the Paris Agreement. We can implement the Paris Agreement. We just need to understand what it is and what is my role and what bit of the Paris Agreement can I implement? And I'll give you a, an example of, of how this actually played out. Under the four years of President Trump in the United States, Trump withdrew from the Paris Agreement, but it, it opened up a whole panoply of governors of states and mayors of towns and CEOs of companies who all said, we are still in the Paris Agreement. In fact, during the four years of the Trump regime, there, there used to be an alternate delegation from the United States of America of all these different actors saying, we are still in. The United States is still in the Paris Agreement. Even if Trump said we, we're not, we are in. We, the governor of California, the governor of New York, the, the mayor of New York, mayor of Los Angeles, the <laughs> CEOs of companies, big NGOs, we are all still in. And so we, the people, have the responsibility and opportunity to implement the Paris Agreement ourselves. We don't need governments to come together to do it. Now, if the governments came together and actually did what they said they do, that would be great. But we don't need to depend on them. We can do it ourselves. Now, to what extent can they wreck things? The ability to wreck is always there. You know, Russia invading Ukraine is just a totally irrational act of self-harm uh, that you can never prejudge, you can never anticipate. You just have to live with that and work around it. The same thing will happen. <coughs> the petro states, some will get better. In fact, this is an interesting challenge for next year, COP28, which is going to be in Dubai. All right. So the United Arab Emirates is also a petro state. It's a member of the Arab OPEC. It's a member of the OPEC. It's a fossil fuel dependent country. Actually realizes, and amongst the Arab uh, OPEC countries, its fossil fuel reserves are going to run out fairly soon. They're not going to last forever. And they know that. And so the United Arab Emirates has actually been investing very significantly in solar energy and in renewable energy. And they actually host the Global Center, the International Renewable Energy Agency, is based in uh, Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates. And they are really investing very significantly in switching their dependence from fossil fuels to renewable energy, which they also have. They have a lot of sunshine. They can actually use uh, renewable energy. So does Saudi Arabia. If they were to switch their attention from oil to sunshine, then they would become global leaders on renewable energy. And they're thinking about it. So these things are not totally impossible. They, the switches can happen if we can make them happen. That's a great note to end our talk on today. Thank you so much, Dr. Hook, for being here. And yes, we can make a difference. There is hope. <laughs> There's so much that can be done. And uh, really, really appreciate you bringing this important topic to us and sharing your, your knowledge. And uh, we also want to thank you for your 27 COPs that you've attended and all the great work. <laughs>
Thank you. Yeah. Great talking to you and good luck to everybody. I put yeah. my email in, in the chat box if anybody wants to get in touch. Feel free. Thank you so much. All right. Take care, everyone. Bye -bye. Good to see you. Bye -bye. Thank you for joining us today. Goodbye.